Hi, I'm Maya Slievcevic, and I would like to welcome you into a new interview produced by DMBC TV. Today's guest is Dr. Jovan Antovic. He is Associated Professor and Senior Lecturer and Medical Head at Coagulation Diagnosis, uh, Karolinska Hospital in Stockholm in Sweden. Dr. Jovan Antovic is also Visiting Professor at two universities in Serbia, University of Nice and University of Kragujevac. Professor, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation, first of all. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for a nice introduction. And uh, I just need to say, uh, first of all, uh, due to sensitivity of all those things which we will talk about, I suppose, I have to give my disclosure that this is just my professional opinion and my personal opinion, and not necessary, or in some cases, even not at all have to do with my uh, employer both at the institution and at the hospital side. But of course, uh, because I am in the background, although I have not met patients for like 15 years now, I'm internal medicine and hematology specialist also, and senior consultant, and I'm in research for about 30 years. So I suppose that although I'm not virologist, epidemiologist, my back medical background and experience in the research make me at least uh, able to, to, to search the medical literature and references and that I can stay behind uh, my words. During our discussion, I will clearly say uh, and uh, notice that what is clearly supported by references and by strong uh, papers and also will tell you what is my personal opinion again as a medical doctor and as a researcher. Well, Professor, you are currently in Sweden and you were there during the whole last year since we were all listening about Sweden and that famous Swedish model, I would like you to explain us what is that Swedish model all about? Um, we all know that Sweden didn't have introduced all those severe draconian lockdowns, but was its uh, model successful overall or what is your opinion about that? Currently in Sweden, it's uh, like 20 years. So uh, I, I start to love this country very much during the last year. Uh, personally, I, I really think this is the best uh, possi potential possibility during this hysteria, what, was, uh, what has happened last 15 or 16 months. Uh, for individuals, I think this is the best one. Uh, uh, I will quote the uh, sentence from some internet forum that only two uh, countries in Europe uh, have not followed uh, stupid uh, recommendation uh, from uh, European Union and from World Health Organization, Sweden and Belarus. Uh, for Belarus, I don't want to talk, and I, my opinion about Lukashenko is something quite different. It doesn't matter. But in Sweden, I, I, I'm really happy that I have been here. Uh, in one of our slides, uh, some of last one, uh, it's a fantastic book, Flocken, or uh, Heard, uh, considering herd immunity, which uh, present by known uh, uh, journalist uh, Johan Aldenberg, uh, presented the Swedish approach. And first of all, uh, Dr. Anders Tegnell, who has been a celebrity during the last year. But I also would like to, to uh, figure out and mention uh, Professor Gietzke, who is an uh, advisor in the European Council and in the European community. And I think the point of Swedish model is that they follow evidence-based medicine. And from the start to the end, they follow evidence-based medicine. Uh, of course, uh, uh, and probably the most important thing, they haven't made any up and down changes. So they follow more or less the same policy from the early beginning at the end. They changed something uh, in uh, November last year. And I think it's uh, a lot of press from politicians. And when you read this book, I hope that someone will translate it in English or in our uh, mother tongue in uh, Serbian, because it's really wonderful. I read it and I thought all the time that the journalist at the end will blame on uh, uh, false health from Indy Hatter. It's a Swedish uh, 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 public health agency, but actually they follow the same pattern all the time. Uh, that what is very interesting, actually, that uh, England start exactly in the same way. And they, uh, Swedish people or those Swedish uh, professionals uh, uh, were happy that they had a, a, a exactly the same approach in March 
2020. But then, due to Neil Ferguson, I don't want to call him professor because he has had uh, several failures before. And uh, even now, and I cannot believe that someone can believe him. And I think that's another important question. You, in the medical issue, you should follow medical doctors, not uh, mathematicians, not mathematical models, and so on. So, actually, there are a couple of things. To be honest, uh, uh, glorification of Sweden is probably overdriven. It's not exactly as that, because we haven't seen uh, theater, uh, cinemas, uh, sport uh, events, like from October last year, and it was with decreased number of people. Uh, of course, uh, distance. I hate that term, social distance. I think it's completely wrong. It's really personal distance. But I think the point was that you should wash your hands, first of all. Everything else is uh, at least stupidity. So I think they follow the rules and they say more or less the situation will be the same irrespective of what you should do. The most important thing, if you close the country, uh, you should have uh, it, uh, enormous uh, number of psychological problems, delayed surgeries, delayed treatments, uh, uh, violence in the family, alcoholism as a problem, and so on. The most probably the most important thing for me, uh, my children are grown ups, or at least boys grown up. Uh, daughter is uh, 15 years old, but those kids in the uh, primary and secondary school particularly in primary, they were allowed to go to school without masks, without lockdowns, without any problems. Uh, those small children younger than 15 even had sport activity outside uh, after a certain period of time, even inside. So some kind of normal lives uh, exist completely until November last year, but even after that, uh, Okay, you can consider probably as for normal person as a problem not to go to restaurant after 8 p.m. But I don't think it's a big deal, of course. I, I still cannot understand the Swedish. After 20 years in Sweden, I cannot understand that you should be more drunk after 8 p.m. You can drink between <laughs> 5 and 8 p.m. But uh, people used to say that's the problem. So actually, I haven't had the mask even uh, after recommendations because in Sweden, they have mostly recommendations. There were no rules, not uh, uh, penalties for anything, uh, no pressure. So people work, and I think it's a little bit uh, cultural difference in comparison to countries in South of Europe. Uh, but uh, to be honest, feeling of normal life as a oasis of normal life in the completely crazy Europe, out of question. We have spoken about Greece, first of all, but some other uh, countries. It, it, it was really perfect. And at the end of the day, although everyone blamed that Sweden has a lot of uh, deaths, at the, at the end of the day, mortality, I, I tried to make a line at the end of 2020, because of course we can prolong the situation and then at the end of the day, all of us will be dead in 100 years with or from Corona, of Corona. But I made the line at the end of 2020 and mortality per million of inhabitants of COVID, what, uh, or total mortality was, Sweden was on 26th place in the world. Nowadays is on 35. Uh, so the point is more or less uh, countries with extremely bloody lockdowns, uh, some of them like UK, France, uh, Czechia, they have a higher mortality rate per million of inhabitants. So, and that what something what I uh, have spoken uh, from the early days of this uh, hysteria or epidemic, I don't like to call it pandemia. Uh, uh, if the situation was really so serious, they probably will collect us uh, and our dead bodies on the street by tracks every night. It hasn't happened. So, at the end of the day, situation is more or less similar. To be completely honest, Sweden make a problem with the uh, uh, protection of uh, adult, uh, of older okay. people in the nursery homes. They admit that it was a parliamentary and the government commission uh, discuss on that, of course. But the problem was that there are uh, people working there are real precariat. Uh, who used to go to job even the, if they are uh, not fully healthy. 
Although Sweden, Sweden has probably one of the best social security system, you're allowed to stay at home seven days without any contact with the hospital or with the healthcare, it's enough just to call your boss and stay. So that was a problem, but at the end of the day, actually, situation in Sweden was not worse than in most of other countries. On one of the slides that you have uh, sent me uh, during your preparation for this interview, uh, there was an incredible quotation about uh, uh, the, the, the way that uh, Swedish people were proposed to manage the older population. Would you like uh, to comment on that uh, slide, please, for us? Thank you. I really think uh, I start to, to be honest, it was on the, on the, last, on the last page of that uh, book. As I said, all the time I thought about book and say, okay, now they will blame on Getsky, on Tegnell and say that they are idiots, they kill Swedish people, but that journalists keep the line all the time. And actually it was the story. Uh, I will just tell it in English. It is nice. It, it sounds probably even better in Swedish, but uh, two, two sentences. Uh, uh, all of us have to choose in life uh, just twice. Everything what we have to do is to die and to choose. Those two uh, decisions is, uh, are the only must in our lives. On the other hand, it was pretty simple uh, uh, what Getzke said, and he's, uh, I think, 70 or 72 years old. His life, uh, he mentioned, was less worth than the life of uh, his grandchildren. And not only his grandchildren, but all children in Sweden. And that was the point. Of course, you should protect Olders. I, I start getting older. I'm 52 now. Still not in 70s, but uh, 52. But I think it's a simple. We had that in Serbia on my undergraduate medical studies. It's something like a war surgery. You always have to make decision, of course, uh, what you should protect. You should protect people who have chance to survive not those who are almost dead of surgery wounds, wounds uh, or something like that, or uh, not take care about those easily wounded or something like that. So the point was take care about older people, but leave others to live normally. This was the first case in the history that we closed society and healthy, I used to say not infected and not contagious people to protect others. And at the end of the day, I also send one slide. In Italy, they make that calculation. It was more or less similar all around the world. Average age of people who died in 2020 in Italy of or with COVID was 82. And uh, only 3% of those people did not have any other underlying disease. I don't have any, any more comments. Also, uh, you have uh, provided me with one slide showing the last results from stati statistical research uh, done by uh, John Ioannidis, a professor from Stanford University, and showing that uh, the overall mortality was uh, much lower than the one that we were all informed through uh, mainstream media. Uh, could you please comment that for us? Thank you. Absolutely, that was the story. To be honest, if you consider uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet, uh, now they start to retract the papers and so on, so I start not to believe fully even in those Bibles of our medical uh, uh, journals. But New England Journal of Medicine at the beginning of the story in March last year, Fauci, irrespectively again what I think about him, said that probably the mortality rate of this would be more or less on some severe uh, ordinary annual flu, about uh, 0.1% uh, or something like that. The first uh, real study uh, uh, from Professor Ioannidis, supported and financed by WHO, World Health Organization, made like in February like 0.23%. Uh, At the end of the day, last uh, publication of Professor Ioannidis, and you can tell about him whatever you want, but the, he's professor on Stanford, and Stanford is everything but not uh, not, not neoliberal institution and supported by WHO and all those governments. And he has more than 400 publications. Uh, I'm very happy that I have more than 70, so you can consider how much that, that is. Uh, and final number uh, from him is about 0.15%. 
even in Sweden, even very early in uh, uh, during the course of this epidemic, in June last year, they considered that a mortality rate in people younger than 69, because they make the difference between those two groups, younger than 70 and older than 70 is 0.09%. So that means the risk for someone younger than 70 to die again of or with COVID was less than one per 1,000. Uh, uh, and all calculation was based on the hide and seek planning of Neil Ferguson physics, who has nothing to do except uh, working in the epidemiology unit. His background has nothing to do with medicine and his calculation of 24 death in China, that average uh, mortality rate would be almost 4%. Uh, difference between 4 and 0.1% is almost 40 uh, fold. So, and it was not the first time for him. He did the same thing for uh, med cow disease. He did the same thing for swine uh, uh, influenza. And again, people make models according to him. I don't want to comment. It's, it's a politician decision. Fully believe to Professor Ioannidis, and that means infection fatality rate. That means a uh, number of people who would die generally of all infected with COVID would be like something like 0.15%. So that means 1.5 uh, per thousand of patients. And that means uh, approximately that level of some more severe flu season. In your previous interviews, you have stated that you consider COVID as an epidemic and not as a pandemic. Uh, could you please like to comment on UK's government decision to, let's say, withdraw COVID um, from the list of very dangerous and fatal diseases? And uh, that decision by UK government was made last year, not this year. What is your comment on that? Well, the uh, term of uh, pandemia has been changed, not now. It has been changed uh, 12 years ago during swine uh, influenza and swine flu pandemic. And uh, uh, one very important word uh, was removed, and it's enormous. So if you would like to have pandemia, you have to have enormous mortality and enormous uh, number of people uh, infected and die all around the world. So uh, just one small word uh, changed the point. So that's the first point. The second point, and uh, I used to uh, prepare myself for every single interview, although to be honest, I have not changed a lot since my first interview in April 2020. In principle, except of remsedivir, that antiviral drug, which I thought at the beginning that could be useful. And at that time, I didn't know for Ivermectin. I more and less keep more or less the same level of or same, same opinion, not because I'm clever, but if you're just uh, open-minded, not even medically, just have a clear mind, the uh, uh, general clear mind, you will keep that. So I check again on 24th of June, when we start to speak about discussion, I haven't checked, I checked some other things today, but British government removed the COVID-19 from the uh, list of infectious disease with high consequences on March 19. So that means that they remove COVID from that list at the same time when they start with the serious lockdowns and all those things what happened. I don't have good explanation, but it's not my task to give it. So I, I leave to your, uh, to people who are watching us to make, uh, uh, to, to make conclusion about this. Since you're expert in coagulations and uh, thrombosis is um, a main side effect, not only of uh, COVID as a disease, but also of, of uh, disposable vaccines, uh, would you like to give us your insight on that? See, uh, uh, COVID don't, not only as a vaccine, uh, but even as a uh, disease. disease is something what is quite different to everything what we have seen. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, from the early beginning, we, uh, my personal opinion was that it's something like uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation, activation of coagulation with consequential bleeding. But very early, early in uh, March or beginning of April last year, we understand that it's not disseminated intravascular coagulation because COVID patients, they do not bleed. They just have 
widespread thrombosis, thrombosis in the lungs, uh, uh, venous thrombosis, arterial thrombosis, all kind of uh, complications. Very funny story or funny, funny or funny. Very strange story was that people all the time, in spite of consumption and thrombosis, they used to have very high level of fibrinogen, some inflammatory parameters and marker, which normally consumed during the thrombosis. So we did not know what happens. And at the same time, we all the time measure D-dimer and have that as a parameter of thrombosis activation. For instance, we have eightfold increase of referrals for D-dimer in our hospital in the spring last year. So uh, it seems that there is a persistent activation of coagulation. One colleague of mine, a young doctor physician, uh, she has presented, it was very nicely published in some prestigious journal of uh, thrombosis and hemostasis, that the, uh, not only absolute values, but uh, development of the, that D-dimer, but also platelets, small blood plates, which are included in blood clotting. Uh, kinetics of them means, uh, uh, are associated with better prognosis. That's also at Karolinska, when we start, among other things, with increased dose of anticoagulation treatment, it improved together with other things, with corticosteroids and anti-inflammatory drugs, prognosis of the patients. For instance, uh, intensive care unit mortality decreased like 2.5 fold. Uh, I think, uh, I do not have a proof. Uh, again, in preparation for this interview, I tried to make all possible reference research. Uh, there is uh, one paper from Chinese group that it seems the although it has not confirmed by other groups, so that's always not sure. And I don't have, because actually my field of interest is hemophilia. And my main goal is try to establish double knockout mouse for hemophilia research. So I, I the, uh, last year I say, I don't want to make a career on COVID uh, research, but it seems for me that something ha really happens with platelets because in that pub, uh, publication we, uh, we showed that increase of platelets during the disease course is associated with the better prognosis. Some of my, it, it's my opinion, I do not have any proof for that, is that when you have increasing platelets, you have less uh, place or you have free place uh, platelets where COVID spike protein is not bound because it seems that there is ACA receptor and the platelets and it is associated both with the COVID complication, but also, and I really think it's very important for vaccine complications. Say that uh, highly, loudly and uh, freely, if, irrespective of what should happen, it's my personal opinion, but it's allowed to tell that during those, all those information which we have now. Uh, if you consider uh, definition of vaccines in all major dictionaries, including CDC, Center for Disease Control in USA, vaccine is attenuate, that means weakened, or dead microorganism, viral or bacteria. Only Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary changed the uh, definition of vaccine a couple of months ago, added the second point, some genetical preparation which induce immunity. Completely clearly, and I think it should be clearly stated, except of Chinese, I, I don't know the name, Sinovac or Sinopharm vaccine, which is attenuate virus, all other vaccines are not vaccines. They're just genetic treatment and uh, gene therapy. Completely clearly, and that's the, probably the reason why people use in official terms jab. Jab is really slang from the street. It's nothing to do with medicine. So you have vaccine or not. So in that respect, I really think that some of complication of vaccines, and now we really see, to be completely honest, this is still seldom complications, or at least those written, because there are a lot unreported or underreported complications, but apart from myocarditis and endothelial dysfunction, it's a, a layer of the blood vessels, which is also influenced by spike protein. I really think that platelet has very important role. And I think, and we discuss all, and we used to see that, not only that vaccine induced thrombocytopenia, thrombo, uh, thrombocytopenia, uh, which is described by Professor Grainersher in Germany and by Norwich, Norwegian group. I think that we have three types of complications. One is uh, 
just thrombocytopenia with bleeding, with hematoma, easy bursting, and those things, like a complication of many other vaccines, not only COVID vaccines, with the low platelets and critical bleeding. Another complication is those VITT or vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia with combination of low platelet counts, but more or less thrombosis, not really uh, bleeding. And the final complication to really very, salsin, uh, very seldom, uh, but also occur, it's a real disseminated intravascular coagulation, crash of coagulation system with first microthrombosis and then consumption of coagulation factors in platelets and bleeding at the end. It is also described and it's also need, uh, not to be neglected, although we used to do that, cases of acquired hemophilia, it's like uh, inhibitors against coagulation factors and so on and so on. As I said, uh, to be completely honest, this is uh, those complications are seldom, but uh, you have to consider that different to treatment to uh, uh, sick people with all other treatments, vaccines used to give uh, used to be given to healthy persons. So uh, really life-threatening complications, my, my my opinion. But I think that actually. Uh, uh, some kind of uh, cross reaction be between spike protein and platelets, blood, pl blood plates included in blood clotting are really important for both COVID complications and for vaccine complications. Is there anything people could do in case of COVID uh, disease? I mean, uh, how could they avoid, uh, let's say, thrombosis in, in case that they already have a COVID disease? Oh, uh, again, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, uh, neglected treatment, a lot of uh, suppressed publication. Don't speak with uh, nuclear medicine, even professors. Don't speak with veterinarians. Speak with medical doctors. Uh, speak with virologists, with infectious disease doctors, medic me internal medicine doctors. Epidemiologists are good, but on big uh, numbers, but not to treat patients. Uh, uh, I can speak uh, uh, what happened at Karolinska in uh, intensive care units with no changing of treatment. I was from the beginning uh, absolutely against uh, ventilators, mechanical ventilation, because it obviously seems that mechanical ventilation is probably more harm than uh, uh, help to people. But what to do to prevent? Uh, uh, personally, I don't have experience with Ivermectin. Uh, there are publications about that. It seems that it works. It seems that it works in developing countries. But from the early beginning, uh, we still have that in our uh, house because my wife is a rheumatologist and prescribed that drug to pregnant women, to a lot of older people. I am fully convinced that if I would get a fever, like two days in uh, uh, together, like 38, 39 degrees, I probably will start to take hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and that's the point, because all those negative results with hydroxychloroquine and uh, potential problems with uh, heart problems, uh, uh, all those things were described in the intensive care unit patient. Uh, it's too late. You should start very early with the treatment. And that's one of the people which I'm extremely proud that we have more or less the same line. Uh, uh, it's a Professor Peter McCullough from uh, Texas, unbelievable ca cardiologist. If I speak about Professor Leonidis with 400 publications, I think Professor McCullough has about 1,000. Uh, uh, that was the point, to start early treatment, not to wait like two weeks, and then when someone developed uh, uh, respiratory failure, uh, breathing problems and so on, put uh, that person on ventilator. Apart from that, I really don't know, is it really placebo or it works? But I used to take one gram of C, the vitamin C uh, since 10 years ago, and I haven't had any flu like 10 years ago. In Sweden, because a lot of darkness, we used to take vitamin D, at least 1,000 units uh, during the winter, even 2,500, zinc, and those vitamins. So uh, I think that's the point, prevention. I don't know what's the point. Do I have a good immunity? But I have had at least four or five people uh, who were seriously sick day after we spent evening working on the manuscript or something like a head to head. And I haven't been sick for uh, 15 months now. Uh, placebo, 
uh, positive thinking, vitamins or something, I don't know. Uh, in the case, because I'm a little bit overweighted, if I would get a real uh, confirmed COVID with a high fever and so, I most probably, again, although it should not be, it has not been confirmed, but I have to manage by myself because I'm a medical doctor and I can taste it on me myself, I probably will take some uh, oral anticoagulant drugs during at least two or three weeks. Uh, people don't need to do that on uh, uh, yes. their own, but aspirin probably would be something uh, good yes. in that case, at least to decrease a little bit risk of thrombosis. Well, Professor, at the point where we have come, um, in some countries, uh, vaccines are all already obligatory. And I would like to ask you about them. Um, let's say in Greece, government is forcing people to take jobs. Uh, even uh, if we say that we don't want to take them, we are forced to do it. And um, it, it seems that there are no uh, solutions to avoid them. Um, what is your opinion about vaccines? Are they safe? Should people take them? I cannot say again. I have already had enough problems in about that. Uh, from the slides that you have uh, mailed me, it was obvious that... Uh, uh, the initial approval of vaccines was for com commercial and marketing use. Um, let's say that in Greece, uh, government um, is not taking any responsibility for, for the vaccines or the side, side effects, uh, what means that each person trying to get the vaccine has to sign on its own that he or she is taking the res re responsibility on himself. What is your comment on that? Uh, you should probably during the preparation from the presentation should show that it's clearly that I check again today. So uh, I speak about EMEA and I speak about Europe, but as far as I know, the situation is the same in the uh, United States. All those vaccines uh, or all those treatments or all those prevention treatments are just conditionally approved. That means it's emergency use approved. So still we should consider that everything what now happens is like a phase three trial, uh, not post uh, marketing trial, which is normal for all drugs like phase four. I worked two years in pharmaceutical industry, so I know even from that point, but it's just phase three, phase two trial, phase three trial, and that means and majority of those uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies will apply next year uh, for official oh, approval. That means when the phase will be finished. Uh, now again, uh, with all risk to be pronounced, I, I uh, sometimes uh, or a couple of months ago, I used to say that I would uh, charge and accuse everyone and take my lawyers if they call me anti-vaxxer. Nowadays, for this, I'm not sure that it's good or bad. So maybe it's even good to be called anti-vaxxer in this situation. But to be clearly, completely clear, uh, I have got as a child uh, all vaccines, even variola vaccine, because it was big variola era uh, epidemic in uh, epidemia in Serbia in early 70s. My children got all vaccines, even including anti-tuberculosis vaccine, although it's not obligatory in Sweden. One in Serbia, another one in uh, Slovenia, because she was born there. Uh, but uh, for swine flu, uh, my wife, who is, as I mentioned, a medical doctor and me, we signed to each other that we would not like to allow in two zero, uh, 2009 our children to get vaccine because although pressure was not as high as now, but it was almost the same. At the end of the day, 60% uh, uh, vaccination rate in Sweden produced about 500 cases of narcolepsy in uh, children. Uh, again, to come to this, uh, still my opinion, irrespective of what happened, uh, now is that what I said, official approach, of course, in Sweden is that people should be vaccinated. And they approach 42% I saw today fully vaccinated. That means with double doses uh, in uh, Sweden. I still think that people who, uh, although probably some real anti-vaxxers will blame on me, I still consider that people who uh, really vaccinate every year against ordinary flu, 
probably should consider to take uh, COVID vaccine, especially if they have some underlying disease uh, risk factors over 17 and so on. But uh, healthy people, particularly people under 50 without disease, and particularly children or people younger than 18, and at the top of the everything, people who already had COVID and had antibodies and had the contact with, I think it's completely out of question. And to be, again, completely clear what I mentioned today, uh, again, some people at the job work uh, ask me, although we are absolutely not under any pressure in Sweden, should it continue? I hope uh, this is really like a center and uh, uh, island of democracy in uh, Europe. But I clearly state that there is no chance to me to take vaccine. And it was from the early beginning of situation. Now, uh, again, seldom complications still, but too many from my point of view. I think that I should now, if I should take vaccine, I should consider even safety issues. So it's not even, if is it necessary or not? We can discuss about that, particularly the story that we should protect our older if we vaccinated, there's no, there, we do not have two proofs. We do not have proof that asymptomatic people are source of infection. There is only one nice publication in Nature, uh, which is also one of the Bible from Chinese, that it most probably not uh, asymptomatic people do not spread infection. And on the other hand, we do not have any proof that vaccine prevent spreading uh, in the society. So uh, with those two questions, they try to press young people uh, to, to, to vaccinate. Again, very clearly, if I have, I have a daughter, son is older than 20, but I would not allow anyone below 20 to get a vaccine against them. Uh, is there anything that you would like to advise uh, uh, to all those people who are uh, watching us now? I try to keep out of fear because the whole story is the story of fear. And I cannot blame. Uh, I try to, 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 to keep up, uh, keep up uh, some trace of religion in myself last several years to try to, to, to turn around, turn back to our uh, origins of Orthodox uh, Christianity. Uh, and I cannot blame anyone who had masks or who are afraid or who blame me why I'm not vaccinated. I can try to explain. But I think, uh, and really we have some proofs, uh, that one of very important risk factor for severe COVID, I know that some of my colleagues now will blame me that uh, I'm not a good doctor, uh, is really psychological status and really fear. Uh, we know people uh, coming to the hospital, uh, worsening during the course of disease, telling that they will not go out uh, alive, and certain very significant number of them die. So uh, try not to be afraid. This is a real disease. I would not like to say that uh, this infection does not exist. Uh, this is probably a bit more contagious and a bit more severe than ordinary flu, uh, uh, potentially dangerous for older and people with serious underlying condition, but definitely not so severe for younger and healthy persons to justify closing of society. So try not to listen to everything what you can hear on my mass media. I don't want to tell in the public again what I think about uh, mainstream media. I have some another some other name for them. Try to keep calm. Try to discuss with your own uh, physician. That's the problem is because nowadays in Europe we do not have family physician. And unfortunately, I, I told in some of previous interviews to stay normal and stay alive nowadays in Western world, you have to have lawyer and uh, doctor in the family. It's not possible for everyone of us. But I think try to make uh, 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 decision based on the fact. Try to, to, to cross-check cross 
uh, information. Do not believe to everyone, everyone uh, even on YouTube, even if someone is against COVID and against vaccine and against the whole story, it does not necessarily mean that uh, he or she is right. Try to make your own decision. We are all humans. Everyone who has a possibility to make a professional decision or to have, I used to say, it's not popular, IQ higher than 80 are able to make contents, uh, consent and to make uh, own decision. So try to figure out what is the best for you and for your family. And at the end of the day, what I try to teach my children, if something is not logical, most probably it's not true. Thank you very much for being with us today. And I'm wishing you all the best in your career. And thank you to, uh, give me, for giving me opportunity to speak. I hope that both you and me would not have a lot of problems regarding all those things what we are talking about. Thank you very much. Why should be? What you are talking about are already uh, published uh, scientific uh, facts and evidences. We live in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for watching us. That would be all for this interview produced by DMBC TV. Business Channel.